Now, without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce our next topic, Understanding Consumers' Complex Relationship with Food. Oscar Yuen, President of Ipsos Strategy 3, will start us off. Oscar, you have the floor. Thanks very much, Ellen, and thanks everyone for joining us today. Um, I know we talked a lot about context in the first uh, session, and I think what we want to do now is talk a little bit more specifically about um, what that means in the context of food with consumers. Um, you know, the, the reality of, of COVID doesn't go away. In fact, you know, um, a global survey that we did said uh, 47% of respondents say COVID is the number one um, concern they have. So that will obviously be a frame as we think through this. But we really want to think about how this has impacted um, consumers' relationships with um, eating, buying, and socializing when it comes to food. So I'll talk a little bit about um, the psychological journey that consumers have gone through and how that's impacted their, their behaviors. Um, then Christy will take us through um, some, some social data, looking at what, that, what consumers are saying about what they're eating and doing when it relates to food. And then Liza will take us through um, what real people are navigating through as they go through the world. Um, in this in this world. And then finally, Namaka will talk to us a little bit about how we uh, look forward and impact and shape behavioral change as we go through this. So just you know, starting off, I think the, the important frame that we have is the, the last few months have really impacted how people think and how people act when it comes to food. Um, back in late March, yeah, probably not surprising to any of you, we heard a lot from our clients from all over the world. There was an urgent need to really understand what consumers were going through. They wanted to understand um, what their daily lives were like, what's changed, what's going to what's going to go forward, and so they really came to us to say, "Well, help us understand what is um, the world of which con our consumers are living through." So we did a couple things here at Ipsos. We have the benefit of being in over 90 countries. So what we did is we started with um, looking in countries that had gone through the initial phases of the pandemic. So the first thing we did, obviously, we looked at Wuhan and East Asia, some of the countries and regions that went through. Um, the early phases of, of COVID and implement strict lockdowns. We looked at what our teams in Italy and Western Europe um, learned about, about behavior and, and um, how that's changed as the pandemic continued. And then finally, we then went back to the economies that reopened and understood what happened from there. Um, we also combine that on the ground knowledge with some existing psychological and academic models. So those of you may have heard of the Kubler-Ross model of grief, which is uh, talking about how, how people go through extreme shocks or extreme disruptions in their lives. Uh, we worked with WHO to understand what are, what are they seeing as the phases of a pandemic. And then internally, we worked with the Behavioral Science Center and some consumer experts to really understand what was going on. And the result is what we're calling the Ipsos Pandemic Adaptability Continuum, which is a mouthful. We call it IPAC. But it really, what it does is it says consumers go through 10 stages as they navigate uh, through this pandemic. I'll go through each of those phases in a little more detail, but the idea is that um, consumers aren't static through this entire phase, as I'm sure all of you have lived. Um, it, it really varies. It changes week to week. It changes depending on the news that you get. And where we landed is there's 10 phases um, that consumers go through. And thinking about those phases helps us understand what consumers are thinking, feeling, and doing, which allows us to then create strategies to meet that. So I'll start quickly just on the first five phases, which are kind of what we've experienced so far, right? So I would say, you know, the first phase that, that this happened probably early, late February, early March was this period of uncertainty, right? Consumers were hearing a lot of news. They weren't sure what was correct. We were hearing things from Wuhan. Um, you know, some, 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 some people in the political realm were saying this is not a big deal. Some people were saying this is a big deal. So a lot of uncertainty to start with. Um, and you saw the behavior and the reaction, right? There were people who were trying to get information. A lot more news consumption is happening. There are people that went to the beach. Um, and so really this period of uncertainty led into a period of preparation as this got more serious and we realized, you know, maybe through, through April, um, as we saw in New York, um, there was a period of preparation. The government became much more specific about what we needed to do. We started seeing um, deaths and cases start to rise. And so probably early March, we started seeing people canceling plans, um, people stop shopping and stockpiling. Um, before we moved into a period of adjustment. And this is when we all stayed at home and it took a little bit to understand, okay, what do I need to do, right? It was the first week was kind of fun. We were watching Tiger King, we were doing different things. Then we really got to a phase where we said, okay, what do I really need to do? How do I feel about cooking um, 
20 meals a week when I used to cook five, right? How do I feel about having my kids at home? And this period of adjustment was really challenging for a lot. Um, before a period of acclimation. Acclimation was really, okay, I'm going to be here for a while. What do I need to do to actually get through this? Um, and then became this realization that this is actually going to be something more than a few weeks, right? This is this period of enduring. And this is not just, um, you know, theory. In reality, I don't know how many of you um, know who Doug McMillan is, the CEO of Walmart. He actually did a really interesting um, speech to saying, talking about what consumers are buying in each phase of the pandemic, in each week, right? And you start to see um, huge changes. Um, the first week of uncertainty was huge rises in hand sanitizer, disinfectant, almost 500%, five times what they would normally sell. Um, then as we moved into a period of preparation, he said, um, you know, we couldn't keep toilet paper on the shelves, right? I'm, I'm sure all of you remember the big toilet paper run. Um, Georgia Pacific said we're rolling out, you know, cranking out 1.5 million more rolls a day than we used to, and production still can't keep up. Um, and then it got a bit more interesting when it comes to food, right? So this period of adjustments, um, Walmart saw their sales of spiral hams go up 622%. And what that says to us is that this period of adjustment, you know, I can't cook 20 meals a day. What's easy? What can I serve that will be a crowd pleaser? What can I do to actually really think through and get through this period of adjustments? Um, and then as things moved on, uh, I don't know how many of you remember, there was a whole huge run on yeast, right? We couldn't get yeast because everyone's baking bread at home. And it was, I'm bored. I need something to do. I want to, I want to do something interesting. I want to learn something, but I want to also enjoy myself and, and, and feed my family. So there was a whole period of sourdough baking. Yeast was up 650%. Um, and then of course, as we move into enduring, there's a period of um, we're seeing hair clippers and ha hair coloring going up as people knew, okay, I need to be able to, to take care of how I, how I feel um, emotionally, how I look physically. Um, and so what, what this says is it's not just simply theory of consumers going through these phases, but actually manifested in their behaviors. So looking forward a little bit, um, we have five phases towards towards um, the back end that that you know we're coming back and forth on. So this idea of anticipation, we're anticipating things getting back to normal. We're seeing um, potentially numbers going the right way uh, before we go into a period of exploration. So we're starting to see stores opening, restaurants dine, um, opening up uh, for outdoor dining, and people are kind of dipping their toe in the water to feel what's comfortable for them. And do I, I'm going to go out tomorrow, I'm going to see how I feel, and I'm going to decide whether this is something I'm going to do longer term. Um, as it goes to calibration, it's really, uh, okay, so what is my new life going to look like, right? Are my kids going to go to school in the fall? And what does that mean if they do versus if they don't? Um, I need to recalibrate to see what's, what's going to go on in the long term. We go into rebuilding, which is as we think about, okay, what is life going to look like post this? And then again, um, settling in. So, all of these, you know, go through phase. I think we're more um, in the middle of this right now, but I think what's really fascinating is what, what Ipsos has done. We've also been tracking the percent of the U.S. population that's through each of these phases over the past, you know, four months. And I think what's really interesting, perhaps a little bit scary, is you start to see consumers move through the middle, the middle phases, adjustment, acclimation, right, as we get into late May, April. But unfortunately, what we're starting to see now is a movement backwards, right? So you see, you know, acclimation, enduring in the 20s, right? Now, um, people were kind of moving forward. You see this hump over here in, in anticipation, and now it's moving back and you're starting to see growth again on adjustment, right? From 13 to 15 to 17 to 20 to 21, right? Same thing in acclimation from 24 to 30 to 33 to 36. So you're starting to see um, us moving backwards on this continuum, which is, um, a bit of a, an interesting phenomenon that we, we will obviously continue to watch. So all of that, uh, just to put a little context into the discussion we're having of what consumers are feeling, because obviously what consumers are feeling drives what they do. Um, I wanna turn it over to Christy now to talk specifically, what does this all mean in the context of food? And she's the senior vice president of our social media group. So she's watching carefully what's happening um, online. Christy? Thank you, Oscar. Um, so yeah, we want to take a look at the IPAC model that Oscar just shared, but through the lens of food. So if you want to go ahead to the next slide. Um, so um, in this slide, we're looking at social conversation from the early phases of the pandemic in the spring. And it revealed the way people think about and talked about food, um, how it evolved over that time frame. Um, so we've got some of the main topics listed here that emerged, but I'll just kind of dive into each one of these over the next few slides. 
So um, in early March, um, awareness of COVID was really rapidly rising during this time. And what we saw were that food related posts tended to focus on eating to boost the immune system. So people were really um, fearful in these early stages. There was a lot of uncertainty and they they really sought some form of control over the situation. Um, and they wanted to feel like they were protecting themselves against the virus by taking any kind of preventative measures that they could. Um, so that's what we saw in early March. Then um, as the reality of the virus and the severity began to set in, um, this really had a jarring impact on what people were buying. Um, Oscar just talked about, you know, people stockpiling um, a lot of different grocery and like essential food items um, that caused a shortage in supermarkets worldwide, worldwide as we all know. Um, and that was a time when people were also kind of experimenting. So a lot of the big brands were the first to sell out. And so um, people were more open to kind of switching brands or, or trying alternative products during this time. And then um, kind of by mid-March, as quarantine became a reality for most of us, um, people started sharing about their quarantine lives on social media. So um, a big topic during this time were the quarantine snacks. And uh, we saw people kind of fall into two camps here. So there were those who saw quarantine as an opportunity to eat more healthy and they're posting about their healthy snacks and their healthy recipes. Uh, and then there was the second camp, which I think I fell into, which was all about seeking comfort through snacking, which meant a lot of kind of unhealthy or more indulgent snacks. Then towards the end of March, as people started to settle into their new routines, their quarantine routines, um, I think people kind of stopped to reflect on life, what life was like before the pandemic, and realizing really how quickly their lives had changed in a really short period of time. And, um, you know, as a result, people were kind of seeking to reminisce or have nostalgia thinking about their pre-quarantine life. So they're kind of cooking meals or eating foods that were more nostalgic or represented great times um, in their past. And then finally, as we got into the enduring phase um, in, in April, um, staying at home kind of became a new normal for a lot of people. Um, and they wanted to look for ways to pass the time. They're looking for new kind of home-based hobbies and cooking. Um, it, it was a big one here. And we saw the rise of the home chef. So people taking on really complex recipes and meals, um, putting a lot of energy and time into preparing those. And then, um, you know, feeling really accomplished about that and sharing um, those accomplishments on social media with their friends. So that was a look at the food trends that we saw through spring, um, but what happened um, during the summer, uh, as Oscar mentioned, we are seeing this shift back now to the earlier phases as the cases are increasing and the situation kind of appears to be getting worse. Um, so thinking back on the food trends that I just shared, you'll recall that in those really early phase, phases, it's like fear and anxiety are really the dominant emotions that people are feeling. Um, and as a result, they want to take control. Um, and in this case, take control of their health and immunity. And we're seeing that absolutely ring true now that people are reverting back. So that looking at polling data, we've actually been um, tracking over the last few months um, how people feel about um, getting sick and if they have fear about getting sick. Um, and we're seeing that fear is really growing um, and it's higher now than really at any point since we've been tracking it. So 44% um, here stated they were extremely or very concerned with the possibility of getting sick. And that fear of getting sick, along with um, you know, the economic impact and anxiety surrounding finances is really taking a toll on mental health as well. Um, and we're seeing this really true, particularly for younger cohorts. Um, they seem to be disproportionately affected here with 34% rating their mental and emotional health as fair or poor. Um, we also see this ring true for, for blacks being disproportionately affected. And um, with this, we're seeing a shifting um, focus in the way people think about their health overall. Um, so in our online community, um, before we were looking at social data, now um, looking at our online community, we've been just talking to people about how COVID is impacting their lives. And we've talked about a variety of topics. Um, and recently we asked about how their view of health has changed as a result of the pandemic. And a consistent theme we saw here was this shift of health really moving away from 
this idea of like eating well and exercising as the definition of health to now uh, it being about prevention from getting sick and kind of doing things to proactively prevent themselves from being susceptible to the virus. And you'll see some of the quotes here, like, I really want to just be virus free as long as possible, or I want to avoid kind of falling into a high risk group. So I'm doing things to proactively take care of myself. And because we know people are feeling anxious, we also talked about how they're incorporating self-care practices. And again, on this topic, we, we do see an evolution in how people think about self-care. So formerly, people would think of this as a pampering moment, an indulging moment for myself, the idea of self-care. And now the shift is more so to mental health. Um, it really includes taking time to relax and de-stress um, during this time. So with people taking this more proactive stance on health, uh, we've seen a really measured increase in the use of vitamins and supplements to boost immunity. Um, so you'll see some of the increases here. Uh, most of them are up 30% or more. This is people reporting that they are taking um, these supplements more now than they were uh, before COVID-19. Um, we also see an uptick in people um, buying more natural or organic foods now. And then um, on that idea of stress and anxiety and people potentially having trouble sleeping as a result of that, we're also seeing increased use of melatonin um, as well to help people sleep. So um, we're seeing people really want to take more control over their health. Um, there is an opportunity for companies to support this need with kind of foods and beverages that have these ingredients that will support immunity and mental, mental health, mental well-being. So I have some examples here. Um, on the far left is a, an, a hard seltzer called Vizzy that has antioxidants and vitamin C. Um, next is a um, company called um, Positive Beverage, and they have a sparkling water with, um, again, these immune-boosting moon vitamins. Um, Kettle and Fire um, has a bone broth with turmeric, um, which, again, has immune-boosting benefits. And then the last example is Four Sigmatic. Um, this is a line of um, like mushroom coffees, but they also have a line called Calm, um, which is a hot chocolate with reishi, again, kind of meant to calm the, the mind. Um, so just some examples here and ways um, you can help support the, these emerging needs that consumers have. And um, with that, I'd like to turn it over now to Liza to really bring this all to life with some of the great ethnography work that she's done. Thanks, Christy. So moving from what folks have been talking about in communities and, uh, and online through social media, we're going to turn now to a syndicated longitudinal digital ethnography study that I first started to design back in March. It's called America in Flux, and it's been conducted by an ACE team at the Ethnography Center of Excellence, which I founded alongside the Behavioral Science Center, which Namika is here to represent. So as you can see on the next slide, um, we pulled in a mix of 25 households with representation appropriate to each state. We had five households in each of Washington, Arizona, Wisconsin, Georgia, and New York to try and get a mix of where the, um, the pandemic had you know, great impact versus where it could have impact. We had a wonderful array of um, life stages, family composition, work situations, socioeconomic status, health status. Uh, and the trick to this was, of course, we couldn't go in person. So with each of these people, we leveraged laptops and smartphones and provided materials and a lot of coaching and trained them to become good to great documentarians. So we've actually used their video footage and had weekly video calls to explore and probe what has been going on in their lives over the 10 weeks that the first phase of this study ran. Uh, it was mid-May through the end of July. So uh, what we did was go through all of this video, go through the calls, do you know, lots of analysis, produce outputs that allowed us to use data that came from people and stories that came from people and a cat that I'm now going to remove from my desk, sorry, um, to use the lenses of anthropology and behavioral science. And as you'll see on the next slide, the initial focus of this work was to, you know, with the pandemic, what were the behavioral changes going to be? 
you know, as people adapted and perhaps adopted new behaviors, would these be ones that stuck? Would they revert, you know, when eventually things opened up a little bit? But in the second week of field work, George Floyd was murdered. And the flux of the title of this study took on many more dimensions. So not only did we have the pandemic, we had civil and societal unrest. And as we saw with Cliff, those political and cultural divisions that pre-existed ahead of the pandemic just burst open to a huge degree for some of our respondents and to a smaller degree for others, but the impact was universal. So across these 10 weeks, we saw people deal with incessant uncertainty. Like the one constant of it all was uncertainty. And so there were mounting tensions and constant reevaluation of, you know, what are my values? What are my goals for the future? What are my priorities? What are my identities? I've gone from someone who works and travels a lot for work to working from home and also trying to help my kids with their schoolwork. Uh, you know, so on each day that these folks were um, corresponding with us, they had to make decisions as to how they were going to tackle that day and what their priorities were going to be. And what we saw emerge was a clear tension between two things expressed on the next slide. It's basically that idea of, am I going to indulge? Am I going to do what I really want to do, what I used to be able to do, or am I going to play it safe? So am I going to go with what I desire or I'm going, or I'm going to you know, be respectful of the risks that may be involved with what it is that I used to do. So we saw this uh, expressed in terms of, you know, do I leave my home and engage in an activity that was a great part of my identity or do I play it safe and stay home and not do that? Do I come up with something else to do while home um, to, you know, learn something new, create a, a new skill just to engage myself? Um, you know, where do my priorities lay and how long can I stick to those priorities? Because it became very tiresome to uh, you know, cook three meals a day for a lot of our folks who perhaps didn't really cook at all. So we saw a lot of, a lot of different examples of this. Um, and I'm going to show you video of this. And I just want to set it up a little bit before we share. And we all collectively pray that it works and you can see it. Um, but on this slide, you see, you know, that these tensions express themselves a lot through food. You know, the anxiety that people have been talking about, we saw people eat their way through these 10 weeks. And most of that happened at home, but not all of it. So um, for a selection of our respondents, we had those who, for the most part, did not change their behaviors at all. We had um, Eric, who's 35, father of one essential worker, rural Georgia, Caucasian, and Yukash, who's 41, father of a toddler, lives in the Milwaukee area, also an essential worker. They both continued to travel with their families. They ate out. They would only wear masks when required to on the job. You know, they both think that the virus is a hoax and just you know want to want people to stop talking about it and go back to the way things were. Similarly, Allison, who we'll see in the video, also wants things to go back to the way that they were. And because of that, she continues to, once the when she was able to find a restaurant that was open, she keeps eating out. So she's in Seattle and Seattle opens far more slowly than the surrounding areas. So she actually did research and found a place that opened about 45 minutes away from her home and went out to eat finally with her husband, which will be the first clip that you see uh, where he basically can't talk because he's just chewing. And you know, since that time, she's continued to go out. She doesn't mind all the changes that have happened in the restaurant space because of COVID. You know, she isn't bothered by the fact that you aren't handed a ketchup that you can use and then the next customer would use. She doesn't mind that, you know, some of the tables around her are empty. She's able to get out. She's able to not cook. She's able to be with her family. So for her, that desire is driving this behavior. But meanwhile, those signs, like the sign on the table in the, the upper corner of this slide, those are reminders that it's not normal. And so Brandis, who you'll also see in the video, you know, she began lockdown. She used to eat maybe one meal a day um, at home. She's a nurse and uh, a single mom. 
Kedrick is 11, and they started cooking together. They were eating three meals a day at home together. They baked cookies. They spent a lot of time together. Um, but she has continued to work. And when they went out to eat at their favorite burger joint, when it reopened, all of these reminders that things aren't normal really ruined the experience for them. So now, instead of cooking together, they are driving to Panda Express to get takeout and watch it at home in, term, in, in front of separate screens. So there have been very many evolutions to, to their behaviors in that home. And then in terms of... Um, Safety, Brandis is interesting because while she's a nurse and wears a mask on the job, she only recently has begun to wear it outside of the home due to societal pressure. And she's really been uncomfortable um, in crowded spaces like the grocery store. So a new behavior for her is using um, pickup groceries so that she doesn't have to go through the store. So she does have certain things where you know, she'll go and she'll take get takeout food, but there are other things where she's made adjustments because of the, the impact of the pandemic. And Regina, in our lower corner here, she's our the eldest of our, our sample. She's 69. She has metastatic lung cancer, and she probably has had the most significant impact on her life because of COVID, other than someone else whose father died of COVID. But We'll talk about that another time. And Regina used to eat out multiple times a week. And that social connection was central to her identity, to her mental health. And now she's just stuck home in her mobile home, cooking at home. She does grocery shop a bit for herself um, at hours when nobody else is in the store. Um, but she's really, really tired of being stuck and not being able to see people. So she's making the choice not to eat out because she wants to stay safe. And you'll hear from her about that. And our youngest, Angela, who is 21, um, she was in college when the pandemic hit, moved home and uh, was able to sublet her apartment, began cooking at home. Her parents own a restaurant. Um, so I wish I could cook the way she does. You'll see some of it. She has realized now that she's tried to recreate Starbucks at home, now that she's been doing all sorts of different meals. When she started to research where to go out to eat with her boyfriend, because she wants those signs that tell her that COVID protocols are being followed. And when she gets takeout, you know, she wants to know that it's from a place where it's safe. But those meals out or that are takeout are showing her just how much money she is saving by cooking at home. And she's someone who's actually unsure whether her future lies in the U.S. She's researching going to South Korea because she's lost all trust in what's happening here in the States. Another thing that Chris spoke to. Um, so financial security and, you know, making that savings account uh, increase is of a, a top concern for her. So Oscar's going to tee up the film. And for those of you who've dialed in, please turn up your speakers um, because you will be hearing the video through your computer. All right. Can you see this, the video? Let me just say how excited I am to eat here. And here's my husband just chowing down. What do you think, babe? After being in quarantine for three months, are you excited? <laughs> He's happy. We're at Red Robins. This is spontaneous. I am super excited because we're meeting our kids. You definitely have to wait a little while and then they'll text us and call us once they're ready for us and our table's ready. Your dreams come true. We had a good time. We did indulge. Everything is basically totally different. They're um, gonna give you a paper menu. You have to ask for ketchup, they're in containers. They gave like my husband 20, no joke. We've been spending a little bit more money than I've been wanting to on food lately. But what I'm gonna have to do is take it out of my grocery money. You know, we're at home a lot more, so been cooking together a lot more, my son and I. We've been eating like, for most days, three square meals a day. Before this, I was eating one. We're out uh, picking up some food to go from Panda Express. I worked last night and don't feel like cooking. So this is what we decided on. He's gonna eat his room cause he wants to watch stuff on Netflix or whatever. He's gonna watch wrestling. I'll be eating in the den. 
because it's seven o'clock and time for Wheel of Fortune. So I haven't gone out to eat since the restaurants were allowed to open. I am concerned for my own health. The logistics of eating in a restaurant seem complicated. I thought that living with stage four metastatic breast cancer of the lungs was a challenge. But these last few months, sheltering in place due to the pandemic and the unknown of the future has been much more challenging. Since I lived at the university, um, there was a lot of accessible food that was just very easy and convenient. But um, now it's so much more of a hassle to go out and get that. Um, I didn't really have to think about buying them, but now I kind of have to think about, oh, is this a smart purchase? Is this something I can afford? So I feel like I definitely have started to go out a little bit more, especially since our area is open. I ended up going and getting takeout from this restaurant. It's called uh, Boiling Point, and it's a hot pot place, and it's one of the foods that's hardest to recreate at home. And then each of them costs about 14 to 16 dollars but I realized just how expensive it is and it kind of made me think about my spending habits overall as well since um, I've been trying to spend less so just having one meal that cost $14 was definitely kind of mind-blowing in, in a way. All right, so... One quick thing before I pass the baton to Namaka. Like Regina, um, and like what we've seen in a lot of our quant data, um, those who are older have um, been better at sticking with even voluntary uh, lockdowns. And Regina has not gone out much because of her health. And Kelly, who is 63, retired uh, in the Phoenix area, he is an interesting example of this too, because he has now reversed so far back on IPAC that he's further back than where he started. And at the beginning, he um, didn't take the pandemic particularly seriously. He thought masks were a sign of weakness. And as the reopening was drawing closer in, uh, in Arizona, as a former food and bev consultant, he was really excited to get back into his habit of eating out at restaurants. And he started to do so as soon as he could. And then the numbers shot up off the charts in Arizona, and he started to take things very seriously. He is now wearing a mask uh, even in his own home. He has two other 60-something roommates um, and is back to becoming a YouTube chef, learning things online. He is trading up in terms of the ingredients that he's purchasing at the grocery store, and he feels that shopping is now like a treasure hunt as he tries to get things together to, to make these meals. So he is an example of how um, our older cohort um, is taking, taking things more seriously. And in Kelly's case, has the income to really enjoy that time at home. One person we didn't see who also speaks to demographic trends was Alfonso, who's a 41-year-old um, in the Phoenix area, gay male, who not as bored as we saw in the data, it was definitely that anxious Hispanic and um, has been cooking more at home, saving money. He lost a lot in his 401k during the recession. So he's really nervous about what's happening to the economy, what's happening in terms of racial inequity, uh, and just, you know, very concerned about everybody's, everybody's safety, including himself, but especially those around him. So, we had a lot of interesting stories come through um, this work and it's continuing. And through it, we saw a lot of interesting examples of new habits. And then also, and Namaka hopefully will speak to this, um, some new rewards becoming associated with old habits, which is you know, sort of rare and, and pretty interesting. So more on the, ha the habits framework from Namaka. Great, thank you, Liza. So in the next 10 minutes or so, um, I'm going to speak about habits framework. So also, if you don't mind, um, moving to the next slide. So before I'll speak about habits framework, about what are the uh, cues and uh, behaviors and rewards, how behaviors are born, and how we can predict 
if behavior is going to stick or not. I would like to present with the two key princes first. First of all, I think we are all aware that before COVID-19, there was a lot of status quo behaviors. There's a lot of routines. There's a lot of habitual behaviors. There's a lot of familiar behaviors. So we didn't necessarily have to think a lot about what do we do. However, with COVID-19, there's a sequence of disruptive moments. Now we really need to oftentimes consciously think about or use the system to uh, mental processing to think about how we're going to do what they want to do. And also, like uh, we discussed before, how to balance the desire and risk. Another uh, uh, premise I want to uh, present is before behavior science kind of uh, becomes sort of a little bit more of a mainstream uh, idea is that one of the major uh, sort of the major idea is desire leads to behavior. Well, I absolutely agree that desire is usually necessary for behaviors to happen, but oftentimes desire itself is not, a, not enough. We need some kind of triggers. We need some kind of cue. We need some kind of mental association to be there for behaviors to happen. So I guess the classic example of most of us, if not all of us, want to eat healthy, that there's a desire, there's a motivation. Do we actually do that? Well, I can speak for myself that, you know, I don't necessarily go along with that desire um, because there's a lack of cues. I, I might not even think about it. Or there's a behavior barrier, so uh, delayed rewards of eating healthy. So with that, I would like to present a habits framework on the next slide. And I'd like, you, I'd like to go through this uh, three key components. Uh, one is, first one is Q, the uh, very left uh, hand uh, of the slide, and behavior, uh, I'll focus on the barrier here. And then the reward. Uh, so in terms of cues, you know, this is something that triggers uh, uh, or happen in, in, in internally or externally that triggers certain behaviors or, or intention to have that behavior. There's a different... Uh, uh, different uh, uh, groups of cues, and this this is not a comprehensive exhaustive list. This is just an example, but it could be context, right? Let's use uh, going out to a restaurant as an example. Context would be that it's weekend. A lot of people are do or used to go to a restaurant because it's, that's what we do on weekends. Uh, myself in New York, that's what we do. It could be the psychological state. Um, it's the boredom. I gotta do something. I wanna have, have something to do. Or the social of celebrating something. I don't know if Alison in the uh, the video that Liza showed, uh, they were either celebrating birthday, they were singing. I was thinking they were celebrating birthday or something. That's a social cue. Hey, there's some celebration to happen. Let's go out to a restaurant. Oh, in terms of Kelly that Liza mentioned, there wasn't in the, uh, uh, the video clip, but she mentioned about Kelly. It's that identity. Kelly is a food consultant. It's that is what he does. So that also can trigger him to think about going to a restaurant. But that doesn't happen if there is a strong behavior barrier. Right? One is the physical and disability uh, uh, to do so. In most of the cities, um, our restaurants are not fully open. Some of the restaurants are still uh, temporarily closed, or unfortunately, some are permanently closed. So the question is, is your favorite restaurant open? And the knowledge barriers, do you know if those restaurants are open? I myself actually did a lot of research to find which restaurant we can actually go in and eat. And the effort, this is sort of go back to Allison driving 45 minutes to go to a restaurant and also figure out, do I need to make a reservation? Do I need to, how long do I need to drive? Do I need to wait in line? What's the weather like? Is it comfortable to wait outside? Those are the effort that could prevent people from actually going out to a restaurant. And of course, the emotion, we talk a lot of emotion today. Even if you kind of want to go to a restaurant, you, a lot of people still have that fear. I, I want people have that uncertainty of what it means to go to a restaurant these days. Can I actually enjoy it when there's a lot of cues, perhaps, that reminding us that we are still in the midst of pandemic. Of course, the financial barriers. And uh, uh, in the video, talk about uh, this as you know, she realized it costs fourteen dollars to fifteen dollars for a, a takeout. So now that's becoming a barrier for her to actually go into the restaurant and say she's not cooking. The third component is reward. Reward is very, very important for behaviors to continue. It may not end the important for behaviors to happen because initially you might not know exactly what the reward is, but in order for behaviors to stick around, you really need uh, the reward. 
And immediate and multifaceted rewards are powerful for behaviors to continue. What I mean by that is you, people need to feel that reward immediately after the behavior. And if behaviors have multiple components, it's more powerful. So example, in case of Alison, who loved going to a restaurant and finally go to the restaurant eating with her husband, you could tell that emotion and, that the, and then also the physical reward and the sensory rewards. There's a multifaceted reward that's there and that also it's immediate. So I kind of quickly walk through this cues and behavior and reward, but let me walk, give you one more example uh, to kind of a little bit deep dive on this one. So let's kind of think about delivery app uh, or online um, uh, delivery or food delivery such as Grubhub and Uber Eats. But if you think about cues, if you think about first time cue, if you think about people who never used this one before, what do you think are the cues, right? Like the potential cue could be uh, psychological, fear of going out, uncertainty of what it means to go out, or it could be that, you know, I don't necessarily want to go out on a weekend because I know that grocery stores are more crowded or restaurants are more crowded. Or it could be in the case of Regina, who has a, a immunocompromised condition, so she is almost physically forced to stay and figure out how to get the food delivered to her place. Or it could be a brandis, right? I'm just too tired. I'm going to kind of try to figure out how to order order something. Uh, brandis is a nurse, and, and she works uh, uh, long hours, and she has, uh, she has a son to take care of. So imagine that somebody decided, you know what, I'm going to use app to order food. What are the potential barriers? Potential barrier is to figure out, well, why are the stores of delivers, right? Um, and then the knowledge is how to download, how to download uh, an app and how to uh, use those apps, how to put the payment options in and how to figure out what are the stuff that you want to order. And that's knowledge and effort. The emotion is what if I made a mistake? Um, what if I overpaid for something? What if I ordered double the amount that I, I was supposed to do? And of course, the financial is the delivery fee. And if you just think about the reward of using delivery app, one is, you know, functional is just getting the food delivered to your place. But the emotional is something new and fun. First time you order grocery, I was really excited. It's so cool to have food delivered to you. That was the emotional reward that I had. Uh, that was, and in case of like Brenda's, uh, she talked about, you know, maybe the reward is that she didn't have to eat with her son once in a while. So if you go to a restaurant, you maybe you, you, know, you have to spend at least 45 minutes to maybe 90 minutes with, with that particular person. But when you kind of want to relax and be yourself by yourself, then maybe, you know, ordering something is quick and easy way to do. Um, and... Let's imagine that uh, these consumers started to use these app and, you know, you do this behavior a number of times and cue can evolve. Even the, the initial cue of using this app for the very first time is the psychological fear of going out. It could extend to, you know, that, that will be the social norm. Maybe in the future, what you do, what everybody does is just have the food delivered. That's going to be the social cue. Everybody's doing it, so I'm going to do that as well. Or just that, you know, I'm tired, so this is a quick and easy solution for me. Or the behavior, too, right? Like, you want to think about, is this behavior going to stick or not? In terms of delivery, uh, I think one of the barriers for people is that first-time usage, the knowledge barrier, which app to use, how am I going to sign up with this, how, what it takes, what's the effort that it takes to do this one. Those, the more people use this app, the less of the barriers it's going to be because you know how to do it. and then most of the app has the little button say order the same thing or you know uh, put everything in a basket becomes much much easier so those with the knowledge and effort barrier will disappear so those behavior likely to stick one of the uh, uh, thing that uh, prevent behaviors to stick is the, one of the key things is this financial barrier there is actually academic literature so suggesting that once people shift a different money into different categories, that would likely to stick. One of the reasons the behavioral science psychological reason is is mental coding. Once people decided that whatever hundred dollars for eating up, whatever hundred dollars for grocery, they are likely to stay even after pandemic is over. Over, and of course the anchoring adjustment bias. Once people cut, let's say, going out budget into half. They're not going to double it again once the pandemic goes over. They're just going to 
you know, put it up a little bit, but not to the fully to the place that it used to be. So I talk about the skills and behavior as reward. One other thing I didn't necessarily have a time to go over is the reward in terms of negative reward. Something you want to think about. Negative reward is kind of like the punishment in terms of psychological literature, that something that, you know, uh, leave people not enjoy the behavior, such as maybe delivery app gave you the wrong order. You know, those are the negative rewards that prevent you, uh, prevent that behavior to stick. Um, so once you understand the skills and behavior reward, what it means to you? Well, once you, you can identify what are the cues, what trigger people to do what they do, what are the cues that are missing uh, from the desired behavior that you're uh, trying to uh, uh, occur. And once you understand the barriers, it helps to really pinpoint, is it the knowledge that is a barrier? Is it the effort that is a barrier? Is it the financial that's a barrier? Now it gives you a direction of where to focus if you want the behaviors to last. And in terms of reward, you want to think about what are the different rewards? Is it an immediate reward, such as eating a, 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 a delicate a, a, a food, or is it a delayed reward, such as being healthy by eating a, a, a salad for lunch, for example? And is it multifaceted? Is it just an emotional reward? Or is it can it combine with social reward, functional reward, and other rewards? So I hope this uh, habits framework is helpful for you to really think about different cues and different behavior barriers and rewards so that you can really sort of uh, be able to better predict if your consumer's behavior is going to last. Now I'll hand it over to Oscar uh, to uh, wrap up this section. Fantastic. Thank you, Namika. And thank you, Christy and Liza as well. I um, just want to spend one minute quickly, I know we're at time, just to talk about wrap, wrapping up kind of everything that we're taking away um, from this section and some key provocations. I think um, the four things to think about it you, as, as people in the food industry, I think the first one is really understanding where consumers are emotionally, right? We talked about the, fa the phases and stages of what consumers were going through through the pandemic and also after the pandemic and before the pandemic. I think oftentimes, um, we think about food in our own vacuum, but really it only survives in the context of what consumers are experiencing emotionally. So I think the first thing is really get a good grasp of that. Um, I think the second thing, which Christy really brought home for us, is really deliver on the key needs of consumers today. Like, what are they feeling? What are they wanting? She showed us some great examples of, you know, food that's fortified with health or immunity benefits. And can we deliver on those needs um, for them as that's what they're asking for today? Um, I think... Third, really important is to really think about how to signal um, what we're giving to consumers. I thought some of the videos, Liza, you shared were really fantastic around um, what signals were people looking for as they navigate, you know, am I being um, too risky or am I actually doing something that I, I want to do, right, between desire and risk, whether it's the individually packaged ketchups in the little containers or whether it's the signs that are in restaurants, what are the things that we're doing to signal to consumers that actually, hey, you're doing the right thing, enjoy yourself, or what are the things that we perhaps are unintentionally signaling, signaling that you're, you're engaging in too much risk right now and you should probably stop, right? Um, and then finally, thank you, Namika, for sharing us, um, thinking about how do we cue um, as consumers' behaviors change and as they try new things, what are the cues and rewards that we're giving to consumers to ensure that if it's a behavior that benefits us as an industry or us as a company or us as a brand, how do we ensure that sticks and how do we ensure that carries on? So um, those four things, I think, for us to remember as we um, take a break for lunch, as we go into the afternoon, um, but really understanding that, you know, food and, and the, even as complex as a thing as food is, it really only exists in the full complexity of consumers' relationships with it. So really think about um, that as we go forward for the afternoon. With that, thanks very much.